Well, welcome um, everybody and, and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Publish or Perish, the workshop organized by the Journal of International Aid Society on how to write and submit a research manuscript. I am uh, Dr. Marlene Bra, I'm the executive editor of the journal, and today I will facilitate this workshop with Dr. Annette Son, GIS co-editor-in-chief, and Dr. Nitaya Panupak, a GIS deputy editor. Next slide, please. So the objectives of these workshops are twofold. By the end of the session, we would like you to know more about how to write a research manuscript that will be representative of your study. And we would like also you to understand the editorial process of an article publication. So what is happening between the moment you are submitting your paper to your, the moment that your paper is being published. We will also give you some tips on how to make your reviewers and your editors happy. And, and we're very excited to do that uh, today. This is the first time we're doing a workshop for the Asia Pacific region. So we really hope that uh, after this workshop, Jayas will receive many of your papers. Next slide. Few housekeeping rules uh, before we start. Please type any question you have in the Q&A section and not in the chat. And we'll try to respond to your questions uh, in a real time manner. Uh, the slides and uh, the video will be made available after the webinar. The video might come a bit later on, but everything will be available. If you have any question, um, please write to workshops at giasociety.org with a subject title, GIS Asia Pacific Webinar. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, previous slide. <laughs> Thank you. So a few words about the Journal of the International Aid Society uh, before we start. Um, the Journal of the International Aid Society is an online peer-reviewed journal, which is open access and which is freely available to all, meaning that you can go on our website and you can read everything, share it with your colleagues. Um, it's, it's all free. And you can see on the, on the slides that we uh, have launched some special issues recently that I invite you to read. The journal is online, open access, and peer-reviewed. And um, the goal of a journal is to provide a platform for the dissemination of essential HIV research. We strongly encourage submission from low and middle income countries, and we uh, do, as we do today, some capacity building opportunities for early career uh, researchers. Next slide. So with this session, we aim to provide you with an overview of how to write a good manuscript and what are the important elements to look out for. But why is it so important to publish? Well, publishing will advance both scientists and science. And from a scientific point of view, results that are not published mean the research did not take place. So you might have the most amazing results. If you do not publish them, no one will know about them. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thanks. So let's ask yourself, and actually I'm going to ask yourself, what do you think makes a good manuscript? Is it A, an, an interesting topic, B, a large sample size, C, a good scientific question, or D, a setting of interest? We are going to let you a few seconds to respond to uh, this poll question that can, you can see now on your screen, and then we'll discuss that together. I see that you are voting. We have around 65% of people who've been voting so far. Just gonna give you a couple of seconds and we're gonna start, we're gonna show you the results of the poll. So as you can see on the poll, 86% of you have said a good scientific question. And 9% uh, have said an interesting topic, 1% large sample size, and 4% a setting of interest. Next slide, please. So 
In a way, there are no right or wrong response because obviously you need an interesting topic. You need, uh, I mean, it's better to have a large sample size rather than to have a smaller sample size. But what is really important when you write a manuscript is to have a good scientific question. Next slide. Because a well-written man, well manuscript cannot make up for poorly written, uh, a poorly designed study. And a good study is based on asking the right question. It's really all about the question because your research is based on a question that you wanted to explore. And in the same way, your manuscript will revolve around this question. So first you will give the reader some background information. So it becomes very clear what, why your research was so important. Then in the method section, you will explain how you design your study in order to respond to this question. You will collect your data, you will analyze your data, you will present them. And then in the discussion section, you will compare your results to existing literature and you will underscore how what you have found is new, novel, and how it answers your research question and how it advances the field. So it's really this sort of circle around the research question. Next slide. So there are very different um, kind of manuscript and the structure of your manuscript will depend on what type of manuscript you are writing. For example, if it's a debate or a review or an opinion piece, it will be structured in a different way. Today, we will only look at research manuscripts. Something to uh, keep in mind is that each journal will have its own um, instructions on how to write, how to structure a manuscript. So it's really worth deciding on a target journal before you start writing. The structure will also depend on the, the discipline, if you're writing social science, it may differ from physics or, or, or clinical science. Today, we will highlight the basic general structure that is quite well uh, accepted, particularly in biomedical science, and which is called IMRAD, which stands for Introduction, Methods and Materials, Resource, Discussion, and Discussion. But as you can see, there are many other elements uh, besides those fee, these uh, four core sections. So, in the webinar today, we will go for each section in turn, although this might not be the actual order you are writing your manuscript in. Next slide, please. So writing a manuscript sometimes can be a little bit daunting. So what should you do before you start writing? Well, you should order your thoughts first. Before writing, you really need to have a good overview of your manuscript. And you should do that by trying to answer these questions in four sentences. Because if you cannot clearly convey these key messages here on your piece of paper, you risk not being clear to, um, you risk not being clear in your manuscript either. So ask yourself, have I done something new and interesting? What problems did my study address? How did my study address these? What are my key findings? What are the implications for research practice and policy? And then start writing. There are no um, real order or right or wrong order to write your manuscript, but most of the time people decide to start working on the figures and the tables first, deciding what will go where. Then they write the method section because it's actually usually a very easy section to write as there are a lot of conventional sentences to help you here. Then they write the results, the introduction and the discussion. The discussion may be the most difficult part to write because there are no real rules to guide you, to help you. So I, I encourage you to look at papers published in, in the, your target journals to get familiar with what people are discussing. So besides just uh, discussing the, the results in light of a peer review of literature. And people, people usually keep the abstract and the title for the end, but that really depend, depends on author's preferences. Some start with a preliminary version and some wait for the very end. Next slide, please. So, to your opinion, what is the most important part of a manuscript? Is it A, the title, B, the abstract, C, the results, or D, the methods? I see that you're all voting and it's, it's tight. It starts. Okay. 
Okay, let's share the results now. So 38% 38 of you said it was the abstract. It's actually, yeah, 22% said the results, 27 the methods and 12 only the title. Next slide, please. We said it's a title here and I, I can understand, I can hear you, although I can't, you might think that this is a bit controversial. Next slide, please. Why did we say that the title was so important in, um, in a, a manuscript and in an abstract? Well, the title discloses basic information and will help the reader decide if they will read the full paper or not. So think that the abstract is the part that is most often read and often the only part read. So your abstract needs to be short, specific, representative and informative. So think about your abstract as a mini advertisement of your work. Think also how you would look for the kind of information that is in your paper and make sure that you include keywords in your title. Next slide, please. So this is another small exercise that we're going to do together. So we have this title, Uptake and Impact of Facility-Based HIV Self-Testing on PrEP Delivery, a Pilot Study Among Young Women. I would like you to take a second, a couple of seconds, to think of the kind of information that is missing from this title. Is it, well, I'm going to let you actually. Uh, think of what is missing. Is it what, where, who, and how? So we have 50% of people who've been voting. We're going to give you five more seconds. And we're going to share the results now. So overwhelmingly, 75% say of, of the participants today said that where the study setting was missing. So let's look at the next slide together. Indeed, um, the study setting is missing. Next slide. So, and to be fair, we actually deleted the study setting from the original title. So the title is Uptake and Impact of Facility-Based HIV Self-Testing on PrEP Delivery. So we know what the paper is about. We know that it is a pilot study. We know that the population of interest is young women. And we know the study setting, which was missing in the previous slide, which is Kisumu in Kenya. So this is a pretty informative uh, title. Next slide. So what is an abstract? And this is something to keep in mind is that this is the next section that is most often read and which is mostly freely available as well. Remember that not all journals are open access and that the full article may be behind a paywall. So an abstract should include all the important details and data of your manuscript, of your research study, sorry, so that it can serve as a standalone summary of your work. So there's the title that we've been discussing uh, a bit earlier, but there's also different section, the introduction that will describe the issue, the knowledge gap in the aim, the method section that will um, describe the methodology used or the approach taken, the result part that will summarize your key findings and data of the study, and then the conclusions that will give away um, the key take home elements, the main outcomes. And sometimes we'll discuss some implications and recommendation. Something important to remember, there's usually a word limit, so check the journal guidelines. Only include text, no figures, no tables, and do not include references. Do not go beyond what is established in your paper and do not offer non-significant results. Do not speculate in your abstract. Next slide. So during this workshop, we will use an article by Wanga and colleagues titled Uptake and Impact of Facility-Based HIV Self-Testing on PrEP Delivery, a Pilot Study Among Young Women, 
in Kisumu, Kenya, and this title should be pretty familiar to you by now. Uh, and this is an article that has been published recently in the journal. So we have simplified uh, the writing. We have edit we've been editing the, the abstract and, and the paper for the purpose of this workshop, but I invite you to read the full version on the journal's website. So let's look at the important elements that are mentioned in this abstract. In the introduction, the authors tell us that HIV testing is a required part of delivery of PrEP for HIV prevention. So we know what the topic is about. It's about HIV testing and it's about PrEP. However, repeat testing can be challenging in busy, understaffed clinical settings, which could negatively impact PrEP uptake and continuation. So this is the issue that they will be focusing on. And then in the last sentence, when they tell us about the aim of this particular study, they tell us that a prospectively evaluated optional facility-based HIV self-testing among young women using PrEP in an implementation program. So if we look now at the method section, we know that the study took place between February and November 2019. We know that the authors have been collecting data from young women receiving PrEP at two family planning facilities in Kisumu, Kenya, so a study setting which was already in the title. At each PrEP follow-up visit, women were given the option to choose between provider-initiated testing and HIV self-testing. We know then that what they have been particularly assessing in this paper is the fact are the factors associated with HIV self-testing uptake and compared satisfaction with HIV testing and clinic experience between acceptors and decline of HIV self-testing. So it's very condensed, but it's very useful. You see that there are no lost word or, or um, unnecessary words here. Next slide, please. So now if we look at the results section, I'm not going to read the results section in detail, but what you can see that should, um, that should uh, be very, very clear here is um, the, the, the words or the numbers that are highlighted, uh, that are written in red, sorry, uh, show that the authors give away very pre precise data. So they give away uh, percentages, confidence interval, adjusted risk ratio, um, p-value. So they give very detailed findings and very um, detailed data to back up all the statements that they are making. So it's a very precise result section. Then if we look at the conclusion, the authors tell us that in this pilot evaluation um, in Kenya, about one third of women using PrEP opted for HIV self-testing over provider-initiated testing. And those choosing HIV self-testing spend less time in the clinic and were generally satisfied with their experience. So in this first sentence, they're summarizing the key findings, the main outcomes of their study. Then in the second sentence of this abstract conclusion, they tell us that HIV self-testing in PrEP delivery is feasible and has the potential to simplify PrEP delivery and with client testing autonomy. So we're discussing some implication of their, of their work, of their finding. And finally, in the last sentence, they give some recommendation on future research. So they tell us that additional studies are needed to explore optimal HIV retesting strategy in PrEP delivery, etc. So this abstract altogether is a standalone piece of information of a study. It's not as detailed as the whole manuscript, but it already gives you all the important information in a very condensed form. Again, keep in mind that many people will only read your abstract and they may not have access to your full, to the full article right away. So they need to decide whether it's worth if either paying for it or taking the time to read the article completely if it's open access. Thank you. And now, uh, Dr. Anetsan will continue and guide you through uh, the writing of the main part of the manuscript. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Marlin. Uh, so wonderful to have all of you here, 270 people so far. And thank you for submitting the questions that have already been coming in through the Q&A. Because we only have an hour for all of this content, it makes it a, a bit tough for us to spend too much time on each individual slide. So we do hope that you submit your questions. We'll do our best during the talks for us to tag team and respond to them in text. So now I'm going to go through some of the core elements of a research manuscript. Next slide. 
So usually when you start, you have the introduction as Dr. Marlin mentioned, and the introduction is where you can present your research question. You look at four main sections, the background, context, what the challenge is for your research and your research question and your aim. This usually goes from the more general to the specific. And it's important that all of these topics are covered at least in some way in your introduction. Next slide. And so I'm going to be asking you three poll questions during this section. And the first one asks what element is missing from this introduction. So as we go through this, consider the four sections that I mentioned, background, context, uh, challenge and aim to determine which one you think is missing. And so a significant barrier to PrEP implementation is the complexity of PrEP delivery due to required regular testing and monitoring. No study of HIV self-testing has yet evaluated the integration of this in PrEP. HIV testing is necessary before starting or restarting and at least every three months before during PrEP use, this volume of testing could negatively impact PrEP programs. Therefore, incorporating strategies to streamline retesting may improve PrEP delivery efficiency. Now, this was adapted from an actual paper published in JIS, and this is the example paper that Dr. Marlene mentioned to you earlier. So we're going to use this a few times in the coming slides to review what might be missing. And so we're waiting for a few more people to respond. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll now and share with you our results, which show that most of you said that it's missing the question or the aim of the study. And next slide. It is in fact the question of the aim. Now we had some amount of detail on the other topics, although not in, in a lot of detail. Next slide. And so if you look here, we did have some background, some context, and some aspect of the challenge, but not really that question or aim. Next slide. And so this is, in fact, to be fair, the, the actual question or aim topic that was inside of this paper that we published last year in August. So they did include the, the aspect of evaluating. Up there, and that's really an important component of an introduction because it tells your reader what your purpose is. Next slide. So the methods talk about how you study your question. It's really important to prove to your reader that your methods were appropriate to answer your research question and aim. And in some cases, it needs to be detailed enough to show someone else that they could do a similar study or replicate the study if they had the same kinds of methods or resources that you did. This is a section that talks about your procedures, your interventions, the data collected, the analysis in your statistical plan. You can use the subheadings to organize content. It should definitely include information on research ethics and patient consent. And from a writing perspective, we recommend people write this in the past tense because the study was done sometimes many years ago, but some even just a few months ago would still need to be in the past tense and critically do not include your results in your methods. Next slide. So the methods usually get at these five questions, the who, the how, the where, the what, and the when. And the challenge you will have is you will want to put tons of detail here because you have whole protocols that are full of this information, but you have a word count limit that you have to balance against. So you have to do your best to summarize the answers to these questions. Next slide. So the results section give you a chance to share about the key findings of your study. Now, not all of your data need to be presented. Similar to how you might have had a protocol with all your methods, you have stacks of data tables and Stata or, or SAS output, lots and lots of details and numbers. You do not need to present all of that, but you should be specific about what you do present provide dates, not necessarily the exact day, but usually at least the exact month or year, 
You need numbers and percentages and confidence intervals. Be careful by with saying the word significant when you're reporting your statistical analyses, because sometimes significant can mean a qualitative term as in meaningful, and other times it can mean of statistical significance. So that needs to be clear in your results. And sometimes people put in vague terms like some people did this, many people reported that, a few people came to clinic. That's not really useful for your reader because they don't know what you really mean. Whenever possible, you should use visual representations of your results. So that could be tables and figures, and you want to avoid you repeating yourself between these different ways of communicating your findings. Your text and tables also should flow logically. So you start from something more broad to something more specific. For example, in your analysis section, you would put your descriptive data before your multivariate analyses or your regressions. Do not discuss your findings though, or speculate on their meaning. Frequently I see people who write, we only found this many people. There were only a few people who reported this finding. That is you commenting on your findings that it was unexpectedly small. And do not repeat your methods. People can go back and look at that section later. Next slide. So this is an example from the Wanga paper that we've been using before and in this result section, they organized their data in a logical way. They talked about participant characteristics, the uptake of HIV self-testing, testing experience and satisfaction, clinic experience, client satisfaction, and outcomes. And so they did this in a way that would make sense to someone who's trying to learn more about what they did in their research. So you can kind of think about it as if I was reading this paper, what would I want to know first? And it often helps to have someone else who does not know your study as well to read through the section to let you know if they think it was logical. Next slide. So this is an example, another poll question, which will come up to ask you what is wrong with this result section. So this is adapted from the paper. Overall, more than 200 women contributed almost 400 PrEP follow-up visits in the study, a few visits during standard of care and the majority in the self-testing period. One third of the women had at least one visit during both periods and a few had two. Most of the women were young, they had never married, they had completed up to secondary school. And most women also reported that they had never used self-testing. So let's go ahead and launch that poll question if you haven't already. And let me know, next slide, what is wrong with this results section? The results are being discussed, meaning there's a commentary on them. The data are not specific enough, meaning there aren't enough numbers, percentages, and confidence intervals. Or C, nothing, it is perfect. When I saw this question in the slide set for the first time, I thought, no paper is perfect. We are always working on our paper repeatedly. So that's hopefully <laughs> whoever answered yes is doing it because they think it's cute. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now and share our results with you to show that in fact, the responses were pretty much the data are not specific enough. And that is correct. Next slide. Next slide. So what you can see is this is really the Wanga papers results. So again, we don't, we don't wanna criticize them. We're just using this as an example. In fact, they wrote specifically, there were 249 women contributing 362 follow-up visits. So at each point, they did not use a few, majority for the most part they actually gave us more numbers and that's quite helpful to your reader next slide so tables and figures can sometimes be complicated because sometimes you have tables that are three pages long and sometimes you have figures that are so complicated no one can really understand what it means so you should only use these when they are more helpful than text to convey or communicate your data. These things should be able to stand alone. And this language means if you gave someone else your table and they didn't see the rest of your paper, they should at least have some idea of what your study was about. 
That means you have to have clear and descriptive titles. You need to label your axes on your graphs, your columns and rows in your table and use the legend. So, so this is, uh, I don't know if Dr. Marlene will not be happy with me if I say this, but you have a word count limit. And sometimes it's difficult to explain everything in the text. You can use your legend to explain some of the things that you weren't able to go into super detail with in your text. And the example is right there in table four. If you look at table four, the bottom uh, right image, you can see the legend is as almost as many rows as the table itself. And it's important that you have that clarification there so people can understand. Now you want to choose the type of table and figure you have based on the kind of data that you're working with and the message you want to convey. And you should be careful with having too many colors. Some of this is because some people are colorblind. Even this graph up there on the right shows red and green, and some people have red, green color blindness. And for the most part, people are going to print this out in black and white because color printing costs more money. And so it's usually more common to do that. So you might want to consider that when you make your table or figure. Next slide. And so your discussion, this is usually the toughest part of the paper to write. You really have to think about this. I, I procrastinate on the discussion section until pretty late. Uh, you need to explain to your reader, did the results address your question or aim? How do your results compare to other studies? Are your results generalizable or of broader impact, interest? And what are the implications for practice, research, and policy? And I want to emphasize that last bullet. That's very important for JIAS. If the research that you are doing is not really going to change practice, the future of research or policy, it's not as interesting to us. So if you come out and you defend your paper and show why it's so important for practice, research, and policy, that does help to convince your reader that it's valuable for publication. Next slide. So this is a little bit more detail about how you specifically write the details of your discussion. The key point is not to overreach beyond the scope and depth of your data. You're writing about your data. You're not writing about the study you wish you had conducted. You're writing about the study you did conduct. Use key references to place your study in the context of other regional or global data and discuss the implications of your work. Now, before you get to the end conclusions, we do want to see a limitation section. Some journals ask you to integrate limitations into the text. JIAS expects to see it at kind of the second to the last paragraph of your discussion. And you can talk about how your limitations impacted your data collection. And you can also note how you addressed the limitations and comment on your strengths in this section. Next slide. So this is just an example of the Wanga study and, and I want to just highlight the red, I won't read through it, but this is how they put their data into context. They use terms like consistent with other studies. This was a pilot evaluation with important limitations. Our study provides important evidence for and so those are things you want to consider when you're writing your discussion. Next slide. And so the conclusions are your key take home messages. They emphasize the implications of your data. They comment about your recommendations for clinical practice or research or policy, but do avoid obvious statements and repetition of your results and over generalizations. And so more, more research is needed. I think we read that statement a lot. You do and we do. More research is needed. Yes, more research is needed, but how is more research needed? For what aspect of research is needed? Next, sent next slide, please. So I think this is the last poll question asking you, is this a good conclusion section? So why don't you put the poll up now, if you can, team? So this conclusion section says, this pilot evaluation shows that facility-based HIV self-testing and PrEP is feasible. More studies are needed to understand how self-testing could be used not only to screen, but also as a tool to streamline PrEP and offer flexibility of testing options. So does this look good to you? Not so good. Okay, remember everything can get better, but in general, how do you think this looks? 
Okay, so we're going to go ahead and end the poll and I will share the results with you. And pretty much most people, 76% said, yeah, this is a pretty good conclusion section, not bad. And in fact, that's what we thought as well. Next slide. So we, we did think so too. And they put in their main study findings. They also talked about their recommendations. And so those are key things that we want you to focus on in papers that come to JIS for screening. Next slide. And now I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Dr. Nitya Panupak, who will take us through part two. And again, we'll do our best to answer the questions in the Q&A. Thanks, Nitya. Thank you, um, Marlene and Annette. Um, so um, please, uh, can I have the next slide? <clears throat> Now, um, the next section is the references, which uh, is often overlooked. Um, however, it is an important section because it shows uh, your credibility. And uh, when you just provide data of, of others without referring to them, that is uh, plagiarism. And um, to this, the references um, section will show your knowledge and awareness of the field. Um, you should also avoid citation bias by just um, citing your own publications and ignoring those publications which um, does not um, go along well uh, with your findings. And um, also, uh, don't forget to format your references because um, each journal has its own requirements and um, incorrect formatting often suggests to um, the editors that your manuscript um, might have been previously rejected um, by another journal. Next slide, please. And um, here are the um, other three sections, uh, which are also important. Um, the first one is the acknowledgement and the funding source. Um, you are uh, responsible for getting written permission uh, for people mentioned um, in this um, section. Um, and you also need to comply with your funders regulation about acknowledging um, their um, support. Um, this is also the section where you um, should acknowledge people who have contributed to your work, um, but do not meet the requirements um, for authorship. Um, the next one is the author's contributions um, statement. Um, it, uh, this section uh, is now routinely asked by um, journals and are often published uh, with the article. This is to ensure that um, the authors listed um, fulfill the authorship criteria uh, of the journal and that um, persons um, who are named can take um, responsibility for certain parts of the study. Um, ghost authors or honorary authors um, can um, are, are, are quite common and sometimes because of the um, hierarchical pressure or sometimes to give your manuscript um, the, the importance, but you should ensure that only authors who have really contributed to the work are included in the um, author list. And the last section is the conflicts of interest um, statement, the COI. This is very important uh, for transparency reasons and um, you should mention all conflicts um, um, regardless of um, that being a, a potential conflict or a real conflict because um, you may not yourself think that these um, uh, interests have influenced your interpretation uh, of the result, but this is not up to you uh, to make the decision. Next slide, please. Now, um, let's start with the last poll uh, question, question number seven. Can I have the poll up, please? Yes. Um, and this is, uh, the question is, what would influence your choice of journal? Um, and um, let's choose uh, from indexed in multiple databases, open access, publication fee, uh, journal's impact factor, speed of editorial decision. Um, primary audience, scope, or all of um, these factors. And for the interest of the time, I'm going to end the polling now and show your um, the, the results. And um, the majority of you, um, almost 70%, um, say all uh, of these factors uh, can influence your choice of journal. And um, can I have the next um, slide, please? 
And uh, yes, all the responses are valid. And, and um, certainly choosing the wrong journal um, can result in rejection, which will be very frustrating uh, for everyone um, here. Can I have next slide? So now let's um, talk a bit about what to do and what not to do in manuscript submission. Next slide, please. Um, what are the instructions and where uh, that uh, you can find the instructions. Each journal has its own set uh, of um, instructions for authors, uh, detailing their editorial uh, policies and formatting requirements. It is very important to follow these to make a good impression uh, with the editors. You can also find more um, information from the resources um, given. Um, but a very useful tip is that um, you may want to have a copy of a similar article to yours from the journal that you want to submit it to um, at hand when you are writing. That's a very, very um, useful um, uh, tool that you can um, come back and look at um, what um, should uh, be seen uh, on um, this particular journal. Next, please. And um, these are um, points on the, 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 uh, the slides are uh, uh, common problems um, to um, avoid. And these are exceeding um, word counts, um, incorrect formatting, or misplacing tables of figures, or using poor quality figures or photos, or uh, the failure to um, spell out the abbreviations the first time um, you use them um, in the manuscript. Next, please. And um, most journal uh, have editors to um, do a pre-assessment of the manuscripts before deciding to send them out for peer review. Um, and uh, this is to check for uh, the scope, the objective of the manuscript importance, um, its novelty, um, its validity in terms of study design and methodology and its quality. Um, in order to avoid uh, wasting time uh, for everyone if the manuscript does not meet the standards of this particular journal. Next, please. Ah, and here, if your manuscript gets sent to the reviewers, congratulations. Uh, but the next step is to um, get the uh, comments back uh, from the reviewers, which can sometimes be very um, challenging, very difficult situation as you are confronted with um, critical comments and major concerns. And um, here are some tips to help you go through these processes uh, of replying to reverse comments as smoothly as possible. Um, first, um, let's go at it systematically and respond to every comment um, and try to comply with as many requests as possible. Although you do not need to comply with all comments, you still have to address each comment. Um, and make sure that you use a concise and measured uh, tone when uh, responding and not an argumentative tone. Do not question the credentials of the reviewers. Uh, it's very hard to do sometimes or dismiss their opinions or argue that the strengths of the other aspects of my manuscript uh, should out outweigh uh, some of the weaknesses um, that um, are identified. Um, also, let's keep your reply uh, short and to the point. Um, and um, treat the reviewer's comment um, in a constructive way. Um, think of it as the way to improve uh, your manuscript. And if they did not understand something, chances are that your readers uh, won't understand uh, those um, um, issues um, either. Um, next, please. And um, here are practical hints to make the editors happy when they read um, your uh, reply uh, to the uh, comments. I'm sorry. Um, to it, it is good to copy and paste the reviewers' comments uh, in order um, provided, and then distinguish the comments from the res uh, responses by using bold fonts or different colors, and detail exactly what has been changed. And do not just repeatedly uh, saying that "thank you very much for the comments" and uh, this has been corrected. Just detail exactly what has been changed, and use track changes or highlight sections that has been changes. Uh, has been changed. Um, next slide, please. 
And um, this last um, section, we would like to discuss the publication quality and ethics. And um, these are things that we need um, to uh, avoid, we must avoid. Carelessness, uh, plagiarism, redundancy, unfair authorships, uh, the ghost and the gaze authors that we already mentioned, undeclared um, conflict uh, of interest, um, subject violations. Um, many questions uh, were asked um, um, here about the um, need to include the ethical consideration and um, the um, approvals from the ethics committee. And lastly, fraud. These uh, the consequences of um, these things can go from rejection or retraction of article to notification of institution or even um, legal cases. Next slide, please. Um, and here are um, useful resources that you uh, may want to um, study further uh, by yourself. And next, please, I think um, we are coming to the question and answer um, time. Okay. Hi, hi, Dr. Nitya. There was a question that I wanted to answer live about how you respond to reviewers who want very different things. So this does sometimes happen where one reviewer says, this was excellent. And in fact, I particularly liked how you did this statistical analysis. And then the other reviewer says, I'm afraid that particular statistical analysis was completely fraught and error prone, and I don't think it's a good idea. So how do you deal with that? Well, first of all, you still have to respond to all of the reviewer comments, but you can choose to disagree with the reviewer comments as long as you have a pretty good rationale or reason for why you think you're right. And you can also highlight to the journal, well, Reviewer one told me to do this. Reviewer two told me not to do it. So after further consideration with my co-authors, we've decided to do it, or we've decided not to do it, meaning to respond to that comment. And so it, it does rely upon you to have some, take some time to think about it. The other thing you could do is you can ask the editorial team and say to them, one reviewer asked me to add supplemental tables on this topic. If you do, you, is this something that you want me to do? And you can have that communication with the editorial team through your response to the reviewers. You can specify that it can be in the middle of a 10 page document, but our team would find that and we will respond to you. There are a lot of more questions that are coming in. Uh, maybe I can go through a few and then uh, Marlene, you can pick a few. So uh, one, when there, whenever the journal asks you to select potential reviewers, do they actually consider these for the review? The answer is absolutely yes. <laughs> During this COVID period, <laughs> we, we sometimes invite, what's the record, Marlene? 30 people. Yeah, I think from some very, and you, you can never really tell, but, but for some papers, you will invite four reviews and it will be fine. And for the papers, you can have more than 30. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it, yes, but sometimes your reviewers, the ones you suggest, they say, no, I'm sorry, I'm too busy, or I have a conflict of interest with that person. So it's not necessarily we're not paying attention to your suggestions, and maybe we invited them, but they weren't available. Or So, so it does matter that uh, we do definitely consider that. And can, uh, Sonia, can you please show the slide with the websites for further reading? Somebody asked to, to do that. Is there a previous right there? If you can hold that for a, a minute and then maybe uh, and the slides will be made available. We've already yeah, we're happy to do that. And maybe Marlene, can you talk about what determines the impact factor of a journal? Sure. Just before that, and, and I would just come back to your to the question about the reviewers. Something that, that you probably need to know is that. At the level, so whenever you suggest reviewers, the editorial team will check the suitability of the reviewers. So we have some criteria and that depends on every journal, but more or less all journals will consider whether there are no conflict of interest between the author's list, so the authors of a paper and 
uh, the suggested reviewers. And it is very likely that if a reviewer is from the same institution um, of your team, we won't consider the reviewer. So we do consider the suggestions that authors are making, but we have our own criteria, like has this person published in the past three years on the topic or was it like the last mm. time, was it 10 years ago? In that sense, we say, oh, maybe this is not the best reviewer for this kind of paper. Or if this reviewer mm. is one of our gold star reviewer from journal, we don't want to overburden the reviewer with another <laughs> request for review. So there yeah, are some that, that's true. criteria, but it's very, mm. very useful uh, to have some suggestion. And sometimes we reach out to you to say, hey, listen, we've been inviting 20 people. We haven't been successful. Do you have anyone else in mind? So we, we do have this... Uh, um, relationship and, and conversation with the authors. Now okay, and how, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, and how many weeks or months are reviewers asked to turn around their review for JIS? Usually it is between 10 days and two weeks. And I would say that the difficult part is not really, you know, the amount of time you will, you will spend on reviewing a paper. It's, it's, it's not two weeks. You don't need two weeks to focus on a specific paper. The issue we have is securing the reviewers. So we give them two weeks from the moment they accept to the moment they return the review. Uh, sometimes we are unlucky because reviewer says, yes, I will do it. And then they don't do it or they are overdue and they send you a very poor quality review. So we're like, oh no, we have to start over. So this is why sometimes it can be uh, a bit frustrating for the authors to understand how, why does it take so much time to get the reviews while uh, when they are being asked to revise their paper, we ask them to revise um, within a month or a month and a half. And, and some authors can be a bit yeah, frustrated. I think that's a proper word saying, but you took two months to do a peer review. Why should I have to spend one month only on revising the paper? But it is a lot of yeah, back and forth. And, and in average, I would say that for the journal, we probably need to invite at least 10, 12 people to make sure we secure two uh, good quality reviews. So it is, uh, okay. there's a lot of work behind the scene that is being done yeah. by, by the editors. And, uh, and maybe, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Oh, so Nitya, there's a question. How much importance does JIS put on novel research compared to projects that corroborate or challenge findings. As a deputy editor, you screen papers for the journal. Can you comment on what you look for in a paper mm -hmm. that you recommend to send to peer review? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I um, myself um, would always think about um, how this paper will be used um, by the audience with, because I think that's the most important thing. Um, whether it's uh, probably a, a, a paper from a very well-designed um, study, but uh, if the novelty is not that much or, or, or if um, it um, does not have um, too many implications um, in, in terms of implementation, it may be read um, and, and um, admired, uh, but not uh, very much used. I, I, I would say that um, um, as, as the deputy editor um, to make the journal becomes more and more um, interesting um, among the audience, I would uh, think about the implications as, as um, the one major uh, factors. But certainly the validity of the um, study design methods and um, how you communicate results is also um, another important, uh, are also important uh, factors. Yeah. Okay. If I can add to that, what we ask usually are our deputy editors when we assign them papers to review or to appraise before taking the decision on whether we're going to reject directly or send it to peer review is we ask them whether it is true, whether it is novel and whether it is interesting. And those are sort of these three criteria to sort of try to look that through bad lenses, most lenses. Okay. Uh, there is also a comment asking, uh, is there a way for authors to communicate privately to the editor, just like our reviewers can do? Nithya or Marlene? In the sense, uh, I mean, the authors are always welcome to contact the editors and the editorial office with any question they may have, whether it is asking just about the status of their paper. And we receive some, some of us emails saying, hey, what's happening with my manuscript I submitted um, two months ago or yesterday. Yesterday, likely that we don't have any uh, 
news to give you. But we do have authors contacting us uh, whether, yeah, about, about the status of a paper or as uh, Dr. Hanet was saying about some conflicting reports that they have been receiving saying, I don't know how to address those comments because reviewers are really split. And so how do I respond to all those questions? So, um, and on, in all journals, not, not only Dias, but you will find some on the website, there's always an email to contact the editorial office. Mm. Yeah, I also would like to um, add as, as someone who also submitted um, journals, uh, manuscripts to JIAS that um, although the process may uh, seem very um, automatic, no, uh, but but we always have this uh, human sense uh, in ways of communicating with you. So so um, I I really um, admire how um, responsive the the journal staff uh, can be and always be uh, to your um, inquiries. And maybe I will answer a few uh, of the peer review related questions and then uh, ask Marlene to help to, to close us after that. So uh, it was asked about conflicts of interest between reviewers. Now we rely upon the reviewers to tell us if they have a conflict. So sometimes that doesn't always work out because sometimes a reviewer isn't always honest with us, but we do ask them to consider, do you know this person? Like, uh, if you, this person is your friend, you probably should say that you have a conflict of interest or this person is on a research grant with you. There are certain fixed de definitions that are used by certain grants agencies for reviewing, for example, grant applications, but we rely very much on the reviewer to tell us. Uh, we do try to get expert reviewers in the field to the extent possible, but as we mentioned, sometimes we don't we get a lot of people who are very busy. COVID has meant a lot of HIV experts are, are doing many other things. And so occasionally, if you feel that you have gotten a review that doesn't, you do not feel reflects expertise in the field, you are welcome to challenge that review or ask the question. But we do try as much as possible to find people who know your field. And sometimes there are people who you have cited their work, you actually don't know it, but sometimes they're pretty senior professors who you talked about their studies and then they make comments about it. We do try to turn these around within three months, but sometimes again, because of COVID things go long, our office makes an effort to communicate with the authors to tell them if we are struggling finding reviewers or if there has been a delay in the re-review we do make that a, a priority to communicate with you, but you are welcome to contact our office and we will do our best to respond. And I'm, sh I'm sorry, we won't be able to answer all of the questions that are here, uh, but maybe I asked uh, Marlene to, to close us and I'll see if I can do a little typing. <laughs> Thanks, Sanet. Um, could we go to a previous slide? Oh no, sorry. Uh, so the next slide, the slide that is advertising the upcoming next slide, yes. Uh, just to flag that on the 3rd and on the 4th of June, there will be a series of webinars that is organized by the Educational Fund and by Love Yourself. So this is uh, for the um, focusing on inspiring a client-centered HIV response in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. And you can register, you need to register actually to attend um, this uh, meeting. So we should put in the chat, yeah, just right now you will have in the chat the link to register, otherwise it's pretty easy to remember. It is meetings.issociety.org. And I encourage you to uh, attend that. You will have a chance to listen to Dr. Anitaya, I think, during uh, those two days session. So um, really encourage you to join. Uh, next slide, please. So you will have a little survey uh, at the end when you will disconnect. So please uh, take a minute to fill it out. It's very useful for us to know what you like, what you disliked, and how we can improve ourselves. I see that we are just on time. So we would like to thank you very much for your uh, participation today and for all your very interesting questions. And I would like to also thank my uh, co-panelists uh, who were there today. Thank you.